I know I am. Well, it is good to see each and every one of you, those who are right here in the room, those that are joining us online. I'm excited about today. I'm super glad you're here, and uh, I hope at the end of the day you are as well. Um, I, can I be honest with you? I, got, I am like, I forgot everything today. Like, even the dog ate my, it's not the dog, but that's my notes, y'all. This is what we're going for today. So set the bar low, right? Because I am one big giant mess this morning. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I want to, sometimes I think you have to, to give some context to what you're about to say, because uh, I know that in a room like this, we're online, that there are, I would just say basically three, three groups of people, right? There are people who haven't committed their life to Jesus yet. Um, there are people who have, right? And then there's this other group that we're going to talk about in Scripture today uh, that y'all will know as the Jews or ancient Israel. I want to share a message with you today that should serve as a warning and an encouragement all at the same time. You'll find that when the, when the Lord was uh, speaking through His prophets a lot of times that there was, there was often a, a heaviness to it, a seriousness to it, but, but there was also... Uh, tucked into it for those that would listen, a promise and an encouragement. And so I hope you get that out of this today. I'm going to read a lot of scripture, right? Just so you know, because I think that I could try to convey to you what the Lord's saying, but why would I do that when he's already done it, done it in his word? But I just want to point some things out along the way. So uh, a lot of words to sort of set up and say uh, that what I hope is, is that you find yourself um, in one of these groups of people, because I think the warning and the encouragement is, uh, is different for all of us, um, but nonetheless, we all walk away hopefully with the, same, uh, with the same idea of what the Lord's saying, okay? So that may sound totally confusing, but I just wanted to sort of set it up that way um, because I want you to understand that, that Scripture speaks to everyone, uh, regardless of where you find yourself in, that, in, those, in those groups, okay? Uh, well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, the promise of, of, the, uh, of the teacher and the guide, the one that leads us into truth. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to the life of each and every hearer, God, inhabit your word. Show us how it is you want it applied to our life. We ask that you'll do that, that your Holy Spirit's voice will be the loudest in the room. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, if you have a Bible, uh, great. Open it up to uh, Deuteronomy 32, um, and I even I told you I forgot every I forgot my Bible. I had to print out my Bible stuff. So this is how my morning looks, which is usually a good sign. It usually means that uh, that the Lord has to fill in the blanks where we're weak, right? All right, so here we go. Deuteronomy 32. I'm going to read a little, talk a little. Uh, Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words that I say. This is Moses writing, by the way. Uh, most of you know or I've heard of him. Let my teaching fall on you like rain. Let my speech settle like dew. Let my words fall like rain on tender grass, like gentle showers on young plants. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. He's our rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything, listen, everything he does is just and fair. He's a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright is he. And I want you to hear like a lot of times we read this and it's poetic and it seems like that's a lot of nice fluffy words, but listen to what Moses is saying. Let this teaching fall on you like rain, right? Let it settle on you like dew. So where we read a lot of times, especially in the Old Testament, we get this idea of God wielding a, a gigantic stick, a big hammer. And Moses is telling you right now, listen, what I'm about to tell you I want it to settle on you so that you can grasp it, so that it means something in your life. Now, I'll tell you, just a little warning, Moses is going to get into some pretty heavy stuff. But he prefaces it with, let it fall on you like gentle showers on young plants. Let it nourish you and help, help feed you. Then he goes on and he refers to God as the rock. His deeds are perfect and everything he does is just and fair. Verse 5, he goes on to say, But they have acted corruptly towards him when they act so perversely. Are they really his children? They are, deceitful and they are a deceitful and twisted generation. Is this the way that you repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? If you don't know the narrative of all this, God 
brought his people out of Egypt, put them in the wilderness, and it wasn't too long after they lost their mind. They just they they went from bad to worse. They they got into idolatry. They started worshiping other gods. You'll see how God feels about that in a second. But if this is a foreign story to you, it's almost like uh, God does these amazing, miraculous things for his people, and yet all of a sudden they twist and they corrupt, which is the way we are. Just so you know, uh, I'm, the, I'm the chief among you know, all these people that my tendency is to become corrupt, not to get better, but to get worse. So if I'm not on my guard, I tend to put other things before God. I tend to do the very same thing he's talking about these people, which is why it's applicable to me today and probably to you as well, if you're honest. He said they acted corruptly, Why did they act, or, or when they act so perversely. Are they really his children? They're deceitful and twisted. Listen to what he says. He says, is this the way that you repay, repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Isn't he your father who created you? Has he not made you and established you? Remember the days of long ago. Think about the generations past. Ask your father, and he will inform you. Inquire of your elders, and they'll tell you. He's saying, look back to these, to these people who experienced the original. We have the ability to do that through our scriptures. I can't tell you, hey, go ask your dad what it was like to be uh, delivered out of Egypt, because he wasn't, right? Maybe, I mean, unless he was, but, you know, in mass, no, not so much. But for you and I, we have the ability to go back and recount these things. We can ask and see in the scriptures what it was like. Let it inform us. When the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when he divided up the human race, he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number in his heavenly court. And he's talking now about, and we're going all the way back to the Tower of Babel, if you know that. He's talking about when, they, when the nations came together and, and, and tried to do what God didn't want them to do, and he dispersed them and scattered them according to uh, you know, what some says the number in his heavenly court. Some say according to the sons of, number of the sons of God. Uh, different translations, but same idea, that people were scattered and grouped according to these things. For the people of Israel belong to the Lord. Listen to that. Because this is that first group I was telling you about. We know them as the Jews, but they weren't called that yet. They're the people of Israel. Jacob is his special possession. He found them in a desert land. Listen, listen to how God finds them. It's how he finds us as well. He found them in a desert land in an empty, howling wasteland. I don't know about you. See, I fall into the group of people that I have committed my life to Christ. I have believed in Jesus and His Word and His way of life. But He found me, no kidding, right where He said He found them, a desert land. My life was dry. It was devoid of joy and provision. There was... There was, it, it, you know, I, I, how do I say it? It was scorching in the day and cold at night, right? It was a de literal desert for me where it just wasn't good. An empty, howling wasteland. I saw my life and I knew that there had to be something, but there wasn't something. There was a lot of nothing. And that's where he found me, just like he describes them. And I think it's important we realize that God will find us in all kinds of places. He surrounded them. Listen to how he cared for them. He surrounded them and watched over them. He guarded them as he would guard his own eyes, like an eagle that rouses her chicks and hovers over her young. So he spread his wings to take them up and carried them safely on his pinions. The pinions of an eagle are the sort of the outer part of the wings, and they're the what they call the flight feathers, right? And so, you know, I don't want to get into the teaching about the eagle, but young eagles are roused up out of the nest and, and forced to fly, even though they don't know how yet, and the, the eagle would come underneath them and r raise them or rouse, or uh, what are they, what's the word here? Uh, carry them, that's a good word. Carry them safely up on their wings. And he's saying that just like the eagle does that, that's what I was doing to you. I was teaching you how to live. I was teaching you to grow and to expand. All the while, keeping you in safety. The Lord alone guided them and they followed no foreign gods. He let them ride over the highlands and the feast and to feast on the crops of the field. He nourished them with honey from the rock and olive oil from the stony ground. He fed them yogurt from the herd, milk from the flock, together with the fat of lamb. So in other words, their provision was great, not only great, it was high quality, right? God didn't give them bottom shelf stuff, He gave them top shelf stuff. 
And he said, this is how I care for you. He gave them the choice of rams from Bashan and goats together with the, with the choicest wheat. You drank the finest wine made from the juices of grapes. So if you listen to this, it's like if I wanted to be somewhere, I'd want to be right here. I'd want to experience that type of care from, from God himself. But, here we go, there's always a but. But Israel, um, soon, let me see what the right word, not the right word, another word. Well, I threw it away. Who's got another word for that in your translation? Jeshurun or something? Jeshurun, is that it? Yeah. Um, that's that's a, a term that, that is used uh, sometimes about four or five times in Scripture, but it's Israel. So if you're reading it and you go, I don't see Israel, it's Israel, right? Soon became fat and unruly. The people grew heavy, plump, and stuffed. No. And they abandoned the God who had made them. They made light of the rock of their salvation. Now, we, when we say we made light of them, sometimes we think uh, somebody's making fun of someone, right? But I want you to think about this because it's important we, we measure ourselves. When I read that, I have to say, what is the weight of the rock of my salvation in my life? In other words, is he first or is he kind of later on in the list? When I'm sick is my first inclination uh, to fix it myself or fix it with an, an aspirin or something? Or, or is it first to turn to him? Doesn't mean he won't tell you to take one. But, but what's first? Because I know, hey, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm a sufferer sometimes of headaches, and I, sometimes I don't even think about God in that. I head straight for the bottle, right? Not that bottle, aspirin bottle, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, somebody's going to take that little clip, right? Oh, look, this is what they pay straight for the bottle, right? No, the aspirin bottle, right? Because I think like, hey, this has worked for me before. And then, but if it doesn't go away, it doesn't take long. I'll go like, man, 15 minutes later, this ain't working. Then what? Oh, Lord, right? I'm not saying, I'm just saying for me personally, that's times when God says to me, you should have called me first. You know? What weight does he bear in your decision making? What weight does he bear in the way you treat others? What weight does he bear when it comes to the decisions you make in life? And when we begin to make light of him, it shows sort of a positional thing in our relationship with him. So we make him light. We make him last. We make him other than the most important. They stirred up his jealousy by worshiping foreign gods. They provoked his fury, an underlying fury, because it is, with detestable deeds. Now, we see detestable deeds, and you might assign all kinds of meanings to that, but what I want you to realize is this in the context of other gods, right? Their detestable deeds were forming and worshiping things that were no gods at all. That they were walking away from the one. Remember just a few sentences ago, he was the eagle rousing chicks, keeping them safe, teaching them to fly, putting them safely on his own wings, nourishing them with honey from the rock. Listen to that language, and then all of a sudden, think about what it looks like to him when they turn away from that, and they start fashioning gods out of rock and wood and worshiping that as though that was the one. And you can begin to see God's fury. They offered sacrifices to demons, which are not God, to gods which they would not known before, to new gods only recently arrived, to gods their ancestors had never feared. So they started making all kinds of things to worship other than the one true God. You neglected the rock who had fathered you. You forgot the God who had given you birth. So think about this story. This is a story, and it's like, we're, we're, it's easy to sit in a place of comfort and say, all oh, Israel. Look at how bad they were. How could they be so, you know, detestable? How could they be so dumb? How could they be so blind? How could they be so this? But the problem is, is as it goes with them, it, it can go with us very easily, very easily. You can have seasons in your life where God is nourishing you literally, supernaturally, like providing for you, like I've had times in my life, I call them the lean years, right? Uh, when, man, I wondered, I, when, my, when I rubbed my two nickels together, I didn't rub hard because I needed them both to be in good shape because I needed every bit of it, right? 
And so, you know, I mean, these times when you're like, man, and, and you cry out to God, God, I have this. And it's like God just comes through and provides and, and you're faithful in and you're faithful to him in everything. And, and, and you just watch how he does exactly what he's describing for that. You know, it's different now because we have a different system, but he provided for us. And I look back and I and I and I think about that. Well, how awesome. And then I, I look back later and there's almost always in the life of a believer a time when you'll back away from that, where you'll get comfortable in it and you just assume, hey, man, God's crazy about me. He's going to take care of me. All I got to do is do my thing and he'll follow along. Well, God is not the follower. He is the leader. And uh, a lot of times he won't accompany you, accompany you in your journeys that you think he should. Because he can't go where it's unjust. He can't go with you in places that are evil, wicked, detestable. He will not. But Israel soon became, oh, I'm, I'm backing up. Here we go. You neglected the rock. I'm in verse 18, by the way. You neglected the rock who had fathered you. You forgot the God who had given you birth. The Lord saw this and he drew back, provoked to anger by his own sons and daughters. He said, I'll abandon them and then see what becomes of them. What a sad, sad place for the, for the Israelites to be in. Where God looks upon them, sees what they're doing, and all he can do is back away. And say, you know what? You have to do it. If you're a parent, you've had to do this at some point, right? You've had to go, you know what? Your best teacher is going to be um, consequence. And the Lord will do that with you. So sometimes for us, we think, hey, I'm going to run forward. You always have to remember, you know, that the Lord won't always hit you over the head with a piece of wood. Sometimes he'll just back away and let you run until you find yourself on the consequence. Okay? He said, I'll abandon them. Then see what becomes of them. For they are a twisted generation, children without integrity. They've roused my jealous, jealousy by worshiping things that are not God. Putting things that are not God in the place of God. In their life. They provoke my anger with their useless idols. Now I will rouse their jealousy through people who are not even a people. Now, that's a little hard to understand, but if you know the history... You know that groups eventually came to power and, uh, I don't know if subdued, but took into captivity these Israelites. So he basically says that this is going to happen. But this is before it happened. So this is somewhat prophetic by Moses, just so you know. I will provoke their anger through the foolish Gentiles. That's us the non-Israelites. For my anger blazes forth like fire and burns to the depths of the grave or throughout Sheol or all the way like to the depths of hell. It devours the earth and all its crops and ignites the foundations of the mountain. This is, now this language here is where we get the scary God of the Old Testament. The one that we, uh, we, don't, we have a hard time even comprehending, don't we? And we definitely don't like to think about. I'll heat disasters upon them. I'll shoot them down with my arrows. I'll weaken them with famine, burning fever, deadly disease. I'll send fangs of, I'll send the fangs of wild beasts and poisonous snakes that glide in the dust. Outside, the sword will bring death, and inside, terror will strike young men, young women, both infants and the age. I would have annihilated them, wiping them out, even from the memory. I would have annihilated them, wiping out even the memory of them. Listen, but I feared the taunt of Israel's enemy who might misunderstand and say our own power has triumphed. The Lord had nothing to do with this. But you've got to understand that when he said that he divided the peoples and he chose his, his people was Israel. It says that was his portion, his inheritance. And so he's like, they, he was so angry and so upset with them that he would have blotted them out, but he won't blot them out. Why? Because he doesn't want the enemy to get credit for wiping out his inheritance. Why? Because he's all-powerful. When we say the king of kings, he's, he is. The lord of lords, yes, absolutely. He is everything, and he says, I am so upset about this, but I will not let it happen. Because I will not give credit to their enemies. Now that's pretty bad. 
that's a bad spot to be in that God chooses to, to somehow salvage you only because He doesn't want your enemies to win. He doesn't want the enemies to misunderstand and say, ah, our own power triumphed. The Lord had nothing to do with this. But Israel is a senseless nation. The people are foolish without understanding. Oh, that they were wise and could understand this. Oh, that they might know their fate. How could one person chase a thousand of them and two people put 10,000 to flight unless their rock, their God, had sold them, unless the Lord had given them up? So in other words, the beatings that Israel would eventually experience in the captivity, uh, there's, there, there's, only, there's no way that it could have happened because God had sort of given them up. But the rock of our enemies is not like our rock, as even they recognize. Their vine grows from the vine of Sodom, from the vineyards of Gomorrah. Their grapes are poison, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the venom of serpents, and deadly poison... Uh, and the deadly poison of cobras. The Lord says, am I not storing? There's a lot in this, okay? But we're not going to stay here all day. So there's a lot I'm not explaining, just so you know. Am I not storing up these things, sealing them away in my treasury? I will take revenge. Listen to what he says. I'll pay them back. In due time, their feet will slip. Their day of disaster will arise, arrive, and their destiny will overtake them. Indeed, the Lord will give justice to His people and He will change His mind about His servants. When He sees their strength is gone and no one is left, slave or free, then He will ask, where are their gods? The rocks they fled, they fled to for refuge. Where now are those gods who ate the fat of their sacrifices, who drank, their, drank the wine of their offerings? Let those gods arise and help you. Let them provide you with shelter. Look now. I myself am He. There is no other God but me. I'm the one who kills and gives life. I'm the one who wounds and heals. I'm, and no one can be rescued from my powerful hand. Now I raise my hand to heaven and declare, surely as I live, when I sharpen my flashing sword and begin to carry out justice, I will take revenge on my enemies and repay those who reject me. I'll make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword will devour flesh. The blood of the slaughtered and the captives and the heads of the enemy leaders. Rejoice with him, you heavens, and let all of God's angels worship him. Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles, and let all the angels be strengthened in him, for he will avenge the blood of his children. He will take revenge against his enemies. He will repay those who hate him and cleanse his people's land. So Moses came with Joshua, son of Nun, and recited all the words of, the song, of this song to the people. So picture this idea. That Moses is with Joshua, who would succeed Moses. He puts this together, and just as a side note, this is on the cusp of Moses dying. So this is like Moses lays all of this out, and then he tells them why. He turns around and he says this, When Moses had finished reciting all these words to the people of Israel, he added, Take heart, all the words of warning I have given you today. Pass them on as a command to your children so they obey every word of these instructions. These instructions, please get this. Underline it, highlight it, circle it. These instructions are not empty words. They are your life. By obeying them, you will enjoy a long life in the land you will occupy when you cross the River Jordan. You see, what Moses was doing here was setting the people up for what they would inherit. He was setting them up for what was coming, but he was also giving them a very strong and stern warning about what it looked like if they turned their back on the one who delivered them, who wanted to be their God in every way, who wanted out of his goodness to, to, to take care of them, to keep them safe, to provide for them, to give them everything they needed. And yet somehow when we read passages like this, if you're like me, you're all hung up in flashing swords and, and arrows dipped in blood. And, you know, you start, you start getting all, all like, oh no, it's that scary God of the Old Testament. And yet we miss that God's telling them all this so that they don't have to experience it. It's not because it was fated and doomed. It was just... Teach this even to your kids so that they'll listen to it. 
you know? And then, and then don't take it, like Moses was saying, don't just listen to what I'm saying. These are not just words. These words are life to you. Follow them. Follow them. And it's interesting. I want to show you something here in a second. Um, well, let's do it now. Um, because I want to make a comparison for you, and a visual always helps, right? Uh, this is a map that you can't see at all, okay? Hardly. But this is obviously a map for someone with longer arms than me. All right, this is Israel, okay? Uh, this map is pretty neat. It is a, a map that was taken from the Landsat 5 satellite at like 500 miles high. Then they added some imagery from another satellite. And you're going, what in the world does this have to do with Moses? And idols, territory, and Israel, right? You can actually look in, uh, you can actually look in, I'm, I'm probably going to say this wrong, I think it's Numbers 34, and it gives you the boundaries of Israel. Like, if you ever wonder, you know, what is Israel? And, and, and all these fights about and disputes, the, the Scripture has already told us what Israel is. It's defined their territory, right? Um, you can find that stuff. But in this map, nonetheless, is an image of a mountain. Okay? You throw that up there. I wish I had a laser pointer, but I don't. Uh, if you look straight south of Bethel, coming right down this way, right? And I want you to see something real quick. I want, I want to show you something in this next slide, just so you see it. Uh, this is, go to the next one, uh, the next image. This is, in Hebrew, this is God's name. God's name is not God, by the way, just in case you thought it was. It's Yahweh, Jehovah. But this is it in Hebrew. Okay? Now look at it carefully. I want you to see it. Now I want you to imagine flipping it 90 degrees this way, right? Um, to where this left side is, is at the top. Now, if you'll go back to the map, I don't know if you see it or not. That is a strangely familiar. Go back, flip it back and forth a couple of times so people can look at it. Anybody see it? So here's the deal, right? There's nothing mythical, magical, or anything about this. You can't stake your theology on it. But I don't want you to miss the opportunity to go, whoa, right? Whoa, why? Because right there, not dead center, but pretty close to the center of Israel, appears to be God's name in the rocks. You see it? If you start looking at it, it's not perfect, but it sure is interesting, right? And, and, and why does it matter? That's the big question. Why does it matter? Because, you, again, you can't stake a theology on this, right? But here's why it matters. Because Israel was and is the inheritance of Yahweh. They're His people. And it's almost like, have y'all... Anybody here not from the South? Just raise your hand. Okay? Just because I got to... Okay. Pretty close. Y'all may struggle with getting this. You might not. Maybe I'm making a, a generalization, right? But I've noticed with some Southern people that, like, let's say, let's say I was going to get my hair done. I was going to go get my highlights and whatnot. Uh, and I walk into the beauty shop and I sit down and I hear uh, these two ladies and, and they're talking about their family. And they'll say... Well, my sister, she did, right? And you know her sister. She's talking bad about her sister. And you agree with everything she's saying. Everything. You're like, you're understating it. Let me tell you about your sister. And about the time you get that sentence out, something shorts out. All of a sudden, uh, you realize that she could talk about her sister, but you can't talk about her sister. Right? Like, like, that's my sister. Like, I'm going to talk about my sister, but you can't talk about my sister. I can run her into the ground. You can't even say that her clothes didn't match. Or I'm going to be fighting mad with you, right? Fighting words and stuff. That may be a southern thing. I've just been living in the south so long. I just think it is. But it may be a universal thing. It's kind of like that. 
Like you read this scripture and you go, well, God can't stand his people. He's like, I would blot them out from my own memory if I could. But I can't. Not only can't I, but I'm going to avenge them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take revenge on their enemy. I'm going after the one that deceived them. I'm not just mad at them. I'm mad at the thing behind what deceived them. That these, these so-called gods deceived my people and stole them away from me. So it's kind of like this thing, you know, a lot of people in the world want to, they want to beat, beat up the Jews, the Israelites, right? Whether they're, uh, you know, practicing Jews, Jews in, in inheritance only, whatever, you know, anti-Semitism. You guys get the deal. People want to go after them. But you got to be careful because it's kind of one of those things where God can talk about his sister, kids, but you better not. Your blessing should be on those people, right? That, 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 that think of a nation that is stamped, carved, sealed with God's very name as his possession. That's why I want to show you that picture. Because I want to make a parallel for you here. Remember I told you there's three kinds of people. There's We'll talk about the Israelites, and we have quite a bit. Then there's people who don't follow Jesus, who haven't submitted to Him as Lord. And then there's people who have. Well, let's talk about the other two groups of people. If you want to flip in your Bible, I don't think I have this on the screen because I told you I was a mess today. It's not their fault, it's mine. Ephesians 1. I'm going to start in verse 9. It says, God has now revealed to us His mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill His own good plan. God does not have second plans. He has one plan. And the one plan was that He was going to invite all of the peoples into God's family. It was through the disobedience of the Israelites, the Jews, that the door was flung open to the rest of us, known as the Gentiles. And this is the plan. Listen, at the right time, he'll bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and earth. So when you think that Jesus just made earth right through his death and his resurrection, you got to realize that it, it created a shift in heaven as well. Furthermore, because we're united with Christ, we've received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance... And he makes everything work out according to his plan. So when you look back and you see disobedience and you see all these things, this is not surprising to God. No more than it hadn't happened yet, but Moses spelled out what was going to happen for the Israelites. God's purpose, and this was written by the Apostle Paul who was a Jew. He said his, God's purpose was that we Jews, who were first to trust in Christ, we bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, listen, when you believed in Christ, He, and this is the New Living Version, it says He identified you as His own, but in a lot of translations it's He sealed you or He put His seal on you. So in other words, I showed you that picture so that you could see you know, it, it, let's just say it is for argument's sake that, that, it's, that it's Yahweh, His name carved into and stamped. It's like this belongs to so-and-so. You know, when I, uh, when I was in the military, we would stencil our name on our stuff so no one else got it because it all looked the same. Y'all seen it? That's why baseball players, you know, they have their name on their stuff. They know it marks it. That's my jersey. It's got my name. That's my land, my people, my portion, my inheritance. And through them, the whole world will come back and be saved. But when you are, listen, think, this is why I want you to see this image, is that just like an image of, of, of God's name carved into the land, God seals you with His Holy Spirit. He marks you with His Spirit when you believe in Him. That, that you could think of yourself marked and sealed, property of. And just like He was Everything from terrifying injustice to mind-boggling in grace that He would still care enough about them to save them. 
That's how He is about you. The Spirit is God's guarantee. I'll say He stamped you. He, he sealed you. He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom He promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify Him. Pastor Duane said in the beginning that it's all about praising. God did everything, all of this. Why? So that we could praise Him. So that we could glorify Him. So that we could stop worshiping these pieces of wood, stone, rock, idols that we put before Him. That we could set ourselves aside, get past our pride, get past our arrogance, get past our selfishness, get past our short-sightedness. And He's saying, look, and when you look at the entire story of everything that went on, it was all designed to bring you to a place where you could praise and give glory to God in heaven for what He'd done. Amen? So you walk away from a passage like Deuteronomy 32, and if you're like me, your head is spinning, right? Trust me, it's a great book to study. And there's no way I could get into all the stuff that's in there. But if you walk away today realizing that God wants to seal you, name you, claim you, identify you as His own, then you're going to find yourself as one of these other two groups of people. Either you haven't allowed it to happen yet because you just don't trust that God. Obviously, a lot of times, you just don't trust the people that represent Him. But God is trustworthy. Or you're somebody who has. So here's my first thing. If, if you're somebody who has, don't lose sight of the fact that you've been sealed and identified for a purpose. What's the purpose? To praise and glorify God in everything, in your finances, in your speech, in your deed, in your worship, in your trust, in your faith, with your family, with your coworkers, with your neighbors that you don't like, with your boss that you can't stand. With every single person, we are designed, sealed, identified, and given the inheritance so that he can say, look, it can be done. I can take what's detestable, what's everything wrong, I can redeem it and make it right in my own eyes and in the eyes of others. And then it may be that you're in this other crowd. That you're like, yeah, I've heard all this stuff before, man. I don't, I'm not really interested. But I'll tell you this. It all comes down to life and death. If anybody's ever lied to you and told you that this idea about salvation is just about being good and bad, man, they sold you a really bad story. It's not about being good and bad. It's about being dead and being alive. Apart from Christ, we're dead. Right? You're breathing with no breath. You're living with no life. And it doesn't mean that your life is terrible. You might say, no, man, my life's good. It might be good, but it doesn't have the stuff. It doesn't have the promise. It doesn't have your creator in it. And therefore, it has no life. So God invites us to life through accepting His Son, Jesus. So maybe you're here, maybe you're a Jew. And maybe you, maybe you read something from the, from the old story of your ancestors, and it, and it draws you towards it. Maybe so. Or maybe you're already in the family of God. Maybe you've already accepted Him as your Savior. Well, just remember, He did it all so that He could seal you and make you His own. Or maybe you don't know Him. My invitation to you is His invitation to you, which is to choose life. God only tells us one time what to do in the Scriptures. I know it's hard to believe, really. But in Deuteronomy, the same book, He says, I lay before you two choices, life and death. Choose life. Life comes through Christ. And so my invitation to you is this. Give yourself to Him. I know that probably means a lot of scary stuff for a lot of people, right? I don't know what that looks like. Well, first it's a decision. It's a decision that I want the life that He offers me. I'm going to believe that He is who He says He was. I'm going to submit and I'm going to lay down my way and pick up His way. I don't want to walk according to what I think anymore. I want to go with what He says. And it begins, as you do that, you're just choosing a lifelong journey 
and relationship with the one true God who will teach you everything you know about how to live, how to follow, and how to live under his blessings, not under this, not in this desert that he described, dry place. If you're here this morning and you want to receive him, I want to pray with you. Again, it's not the prayer. It's your heart. It's your confession that I want to follow. So if you're here this morning, uh, you can just pray this prayer after me. Right? These are just some words to help you maybe express what you're doing. If you want to follow him, make him your Lord today, then just do me this favor. Y'all don't look around. Maybe somebody's a little nervous or something. Just raise your hand up so I know who I'm praying with and just repeat this prayer after me. You know, Lord, Lord Jesus, I don't know what it looks like to follow you, but I want to. I know I've sinned and done things that separate me from you. But through your son Jesus today, I'm asking you for life. I'm asking you for forgiveness of my sin. I'm asking you to transform me, change me, and teach me how to follow you and love you and live for you. Put your seal on me, I ask. And help me follow you the rest of my life. I ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, congratulations, guys. That's awesome. Would y'all stand with me? Hey guys, it's uh, it's a good day. It's my wife's line. She always encourages me. It's a good day to have a good day. So as you leave here, I pray maybe you'll hang out with some of your church family you don't know. If you're going to lunch, invite somebody you don't know. It matters, guys, that we know each other and that we know our God. It's just a great thing to do. So I just want to pray a blessing over you as we go. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you will guard the hearts of your people. Lord, set this word in us. Let it do what Moses said. Let it, let it fall on us like rain on young plants. Let it nourish and, and, and build something in us, God, that we grow to understand how serious you are about us finding our life in you through Christ. Lord, I pray that we'll share it, that we'll live it, and that everything we do brings you praise and brings you glory. And I ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Love you very much. We'll see you soon.